Hi everyone, so here we are with chapter 10, and chapter 10 is on states of matter. Okay, so let's review our three states of matter. We have solids, liquids, and gases. Let's first talk about solids. So here's a picture of a solid. Notice in that picture, the particles are organized. They're kind of stuck in the structure. We call that um, being rigid. It's very rigid, okay? So it's organized, it's very rigid, and the particles are not able to move around freely, but they do vibrate some at those fixed points. Then we have a liquid. So over here is a picture representing a liquid. Notice that the particles are not stuck in the rigid structure. Now the particles are able to move around, uh, move around freely, okay? They're able to what we call slip and slide past each other. Then this last picture over here represents a gas. So gas particles are bouncing around all over the place. Those are the ones that are what I like to say, they're bouncing off the walls, okay? They're able to move around freely and they're like all over the place. So let's review some of these terms. And some of these terms we talked about way at the very beginning of the semester. Kinetic energy and potential energy. Okay, so kinetic energy is the energy of motion for particles that are moving. Potential energy is what we call stored energy for objects that are not moving. So it's storing the energy to do work later. So um, based on these three states of matter, which one has the greatest kinetic energy? Okay, which one has the greatest movement? And so yes, that would be your gas, okay? The gases have the greatest kinetic energy. They're moving around the most. Which state of matter would have the least amount of kinetic energy? Right, the solids. Okay, the solids would have the least amount of kinetic energy. Okay, so this is going to lead to what we call the kinetic theory. So the kinetic theory is for gases. Okay, so let's write that down. Okay, this is for a gas. So, for the objects that are moving. So, according to the kinetic theory, it states these things. Um, and just as a reminder, um, theories are just a set of guidelines to help us understand the reason why things do the things they do. Okay? So, this is a theory to help us understand the behavior of gases. So, according to this theory, particles are small hard spheres, okay, with insignificant volume. So that basically means that they're saying the gases basically uh, do not have any volume. Their volume is zero. Mostly empty space, okay, no attractive or repulsive forces, all right? And also according to this theory, it says that the particles are in constant and rapid motion. So that means they're constantly moving and that all collisions are perfectly elastic. So let me explain to you what perfectly elastic means. Perfectly elastic means that when they collide and hit each other, so when these particles collide and hit each other, they're going to bounce back with the same amount of energy. Okay, so let me give you an example. Think of a basketball. If you were to drop a basketball, it will continue to bounce, right? But is it continuing to bounce at the same height every time? So think about that. No, it's not, right? The bounce becomes or the bounce decreases every time, right? To the point where eventually it'll just stop. So that is what we call inelastic, okay? That would be an inelastic example. So your gases, according to the theory, are perfectly elastic. So once again, if it was perfectly elastic, the basketball would bounce back at the same height every time. And so that's kind of what they're saying about the gas particles. They're colliding, hitting each other, then they're going to bounce back with that same amount of energy. Okay, so you need to know what this theory states. Remember, it's just a set of guidelines to help us understand the behavior of gases. But there are act there's actually two things that are wrong with the theory. Okay, there's actually two things with, um, that are wrong with the theory. So I'm going to highlight them, and you should highlight them also in your notes. Um, the two things that are wrong with the theory, uh, one of them is 
the insignificant volume. Okay, insignificant volume. Um, gases actually do have volume. So later we will talk about this in later chapters, that gases actually do occupy volume. Okay, and this other statement here is also incorrect. No attractive or repulsive forces. So later we will discover that gases actually do have attractive and repulsive forces. And we'll talk about these, and these are what we refer to as our intermolecular forces, and we'll talk about that mostly in second semester, okay? But everything else that's stated here is true. Yes, the particles are small hard spheres. They do occupy mostly empty space. Yes, they are in constant rapid motion, okay? We also should add in the word random, constant, rapid, and random motion. And yes, their collisions are perfectly elastic, okay? So once again, you should know what the theory states and then also know what is wrong with the theory, okay? All right, so let's talk about gas pressure. So the definition is written there, and a lot of you already kind of know what pressure is. Um, if we are talking about a vacuum, so a vacuum means there are no particles, no pressure, because it sucks all of the air out of there. Um, and then let's talk about atmospheric pressure. Ooh, not a highlighter. Let's switch. Okay. So let's talk about atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure obviously is pressure within the atmosphere. So it states these two things, or these two relationships here that we're going to talk about with about atmospheric pressure. Um, it says that atmospheric pressure decreases, decreases as altitude increases. Okay, so as altitude goes up, right? So let's think about this. Altitude. So as altitude increases, so that means you're climbing up in the mountains. So if you're up in the mountains, a higher elevation, your pressure or your atmospheric pressure goes down. Okay? Atmospheric pressure goes down. So altitude goes up, but the pressure goes down. And that is something that you have probably experienced um, as you're up in the mountains, you notice that sometimes it's harder for you to breathe, and that's because of the lower pressure. Because of the lower pressure, it's not forcing the oxygen into your lungs, okay? This is what we call an inverse relationship. So an inverse relationship is when you have one thing going up and one thing going down. They're going in opposite directions. So we call that inverse or indirect. All right, this next statement here. Collisions decrease as pressure decrease, okay? So the collisions between the particles are going to decrease. So let's draw a down arrow representing that. So collisions go down. Therefore, pressure also goes down, okay? And that makes sense, okay? The fewer the collisions, then therefore, the less pressure you're going to have. So notice that both of these arrows are going in the same direction. So if they're going in the same direction, this is what we call a direct relationship. Okay, so this is a direct relationship. They're going in the same direction. So if it was the opposite, if collisions increased, then therefore pressure would also increase. Okay? Here is a picture of an old school barometer. So a barometer is a measuring instrument that we would use to measure atmospheric pressure. So way back in the day, they used to use these barometers that were filled with mercury. So that's what's in the dish here. This is mercury, and then mercury is in the tube here. And so let me just kind of explain to you what this apparatus looks like and what's going on. So we have mercury in the dish, and then look at the tube. The tube is inverted, okay? The tube is inverted. It's open on this end here, okay? That end is open, and then this end here is closed. So it's open on one side and closed on the other. So it's inverted in the dish. So depending on the atmospheric pressure, so the atmospheric pressure pushes down on the liquid, therefore forcing the liquid to fill the tube, okay, to fill the tube. So what they, um, how they would measure 
the atmospheric pressure, they would measure the length of the tube, okay? Or I should say they measured the length of the mercury in the tube. So you can see that the mercury line is right here. So they measured from there to the surface of wherever the um, mercury was in the dish. So they would measure that distance and notice that it's in the unit of millimeters. So millimeters is a length unit, but this is one way how they used to measure pressure, okay? So this is something that you have to recognize as a pressure unit. So this is a pressure unit, millimeters of mercury, okay, is a pressure unit. And 760 millimeters of mercury is actually what we consider standard pressure. So that is something that you just have to recognize that this is one way that they could measure pressure is measuring the length of mercury in the tube. Now let's talk about all the different types of pressure units. So the SI unit for pressure is KPA, which stands for kilopascals, okay? So remember SI is the international system of units, so kind of like the standard set of units that we would use. So we would use kilopascals. Here's a, here's a list of other possible units that you will most likely see like in the textbook or worksheets or whatever the case is. You'll see these other pressure units, okay? So 101.3 kPa, that is standard pressure, okay? Standard pressure at sea level. So let's write that down. Standard pressure, which means it's at sea level. So we are at sea level. And other standard pressure units would be 1 ATM, 760 millimeters of mercury, 30 inches of mercury, or 760 tor. Okay? These are the th these are the different pressure units that you need to be familiar with. And you have to also be able to convert back and forth between the different pressure units. Um, so the th out of all these that you should memorize, you should memorize 101.3 kPa, 1 ATM, 760 millimeters of mercury, and 760 tor. We really won't use um, inches of mercury in chemistry too often, but the other ones you will see a lot, okay? So make sure you have those numbers memorized. So let's do a sample question. What if we have 2.7 atmospheres, and I want you to convert that into kilopascals, okay? So it's just unit conversion. So you start off with the 2.7 ATM, and then these numbers here, we are just going to place on top and bottom depending on what we want to get crossed out, okay? So if we have atmospheres here, then we want the 1 ATM on the bottom of the next step, so that would get canceled out. So 1 ATM on the bottom, so you can see that your atmospheres would cross out, then we want our answer in kilopascals, so therefore we're going to use the KPA number up on top. So 101.3 KPA. Okay, so we put this into our calculator, so you should get, have your calculator out to try and do this. So let's see, 2.7 times 101.3. All right, so this ends up being... 273.5, and that's kPa. Okay, so let's just kind of squished over there. So 273.5 kilopascals. All right, so you have to know how to convert your pressure units. So have all of those numbers memorized, except for the inches, okay? All right, so now let's talk about kinetic energy and its relationship with temperature. And I'll explain why it says Kelvin temperature there in a little bit. So if you read that definition that's stated there, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. So let's take a look at kinetic energy and the temperature relationship. Increase kinetic energy, increase in temperature. So that means... This is going up, right? If that increases, therefore, 
temperature also increases. So what type of relationship is that? Notice they're going in the same direction, right? So therefore, this is a direct relationship. So let's think about what's happening and why this makes sense. So if you increase the kinetic energy, that means your particles are moving around a lot more. They're moving around faster, more collisions, okay? And therefore, if they're moving around a lot more, then therefore, that's going to increase the temperature, okay? It's going to increase the temperature. You can also think about it if you are just thinking about the increase in temperature and how that affects kinetic energy. So if you increase temperature, you're heating up the particles, they're going to move around a lot more. So then it's the opposite, obviously, if you're going to decrease the kinetic energy. So now the particles are slowing down. Therefore, there's a decrease in the temperature, okay? So if you're cooling something down, then the particles are going to slow down and have fewer collisions. And so this is only a true direct relationship if your temperature is in Kelvin, okay? If your temperature is, is in Kelvin. Now, there is this term called absolute zero. So make sure you understand what absolute zero means. Uh, the term absolute is referring to the Kelvin scale, okay? That refers to the Kelvin scale. So if they're talking about absolute temperature or absolute zero, they're talking about the Kelvin scale. So therefore, absolute zero means or is related to zero Kelvin. And absolute zero is the lowest possible temperature, all right? The lowest possible temperature. So that means that your particles are going to stop moving at zero Kelvin or absolute zero if that is the lowest possible temperature. Now, what is zero Kelvin equivalent to in degrees Celsius? Okay, what is that equivalent to in degrees Celsius? So remember, to go from um, Celsius to Kelvin, what do you have to add? You have to add 273, right? to get it into the Kelvin temperature scale. So therefore, if it's a zero Kelvin, you would get negative 273 degrees Celsius, okay? So that would be negative 273 degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to zero Kelvin. Now we're gonna talk about evaporation, all right, evaporation. So according to this picture, these are particles in the liquid state. Okay, these are all various particles in the liquid state. So here's the surface of your liquid. And we know that eventually these liquid particles, they can evaporate and go into the gas phase. Okay, they can go into the gas phase. But in order for a particle to evaporate, it has to overcome the intermolecular forces. Okay, it has to overcome the intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces are the forces between molecules or particles. Okay, they are the forces between the particles. So that's what the prefix inter means, between. So that's what all the little dashed lines here represent. Intermolecular forces, okay? So once again, in order for a liquid to evaporate, it has to have enough kinetic energy to break free from these bonds, all right? It has to have enough energy to break free from all of these bonds. So what is something that you can do to give, to give these particles enough energy? Or what could you do to get your liquid to evaporate faster? Think about that. What could you do to get these particles to evaporate faster, to give them enough energy? You could increase the temperature, right? So if you increase the temperature, it increases the kinetic energy. Therefore, they'll have enough energy to break free from those bonds, and then they can go and evaporate off into the gas phase. Okay, they can evaporate off into the gas phase. So they have to have enough energy in order to overcome the intermolecular forces. All right, so now let's talk more about evaporation. All right, let's talk more about evaporation. So we already discussed this concept right here. 
To evaporate, molecules must have a certain minimum kinetic energy to overcome the attractive forces. And this is the really cool thing I want to talk about. Evaporation is a cooling process. Okay, evaporation is a cooling process. So let's think about this a little bit and why we consider it a cooling process. So if a liquid is evaporating, which particles are going to leave first? Okay, which particles are going to leave first? The ones with the most kinetic energy or the ones with the least kinetic energy? Hmm. Well, the ones with the most kinetic energy are going to leave first. All right, so the ones with the most kinetic energy, most kinetic energy leave first. So if the ones with the most kinetic energy are leaving first, I like to call these the hot ones, okay? The hot ones. So the hot ones are leaving first, therefore leaving the remaining solution or liquid to be cooler, right? Because all the hot ones left first or the ones with the most kinetic energy left first, therefore the cooler ones are left behind. That is why evaporation is considered a cooling process, okay, cooling process. And we're actually going to do a bell jar lab, and um, you're actually going to witness how evaporation is a cooling process. So evaporation is when we are going from liquid to gas, and then if we're going in the opposite direction, gas to liquid, we call that condensation, all right, condensation. And notice here that I have a double-headed arrow. So the double-headed arrow represents this concept called equilibrium. So we have a forward rate and we have a reverse rate, or what we say the reaction is reversible. It can go forwards and it can go backwards. So in order to have equilibrium established, there are some conditions that have to be satisfied. It has to be in a closed container. It has to be in a closed container in order to have equilibrium. And also, it is important to know about equilibrium that the rates are equal. Okay? The rates are equal. That's why there's an equal sign there. So the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. So if this is occurring in a closed container, you're always going to have the same number of particles that are in the liquid phase and in the gas phase. Okay, so for equilibrium, it is important to know that the rates are equal. The forward rate equals the reverse rate. Now let's talk about vapor pressure. I like to describe vapor pressure in terms of how easy or how difficult it is for a liquid to evaporate. So something that has high vapor pressure, that means that it has a lot of vapor, okay, a lot of vapor. And that means that it evaporates very easily. So if something evaporates very easily, would you think those attractive forces are strong or weak if it evaporates easily? So if it, evapor if it evaporates easily, then that means it has weak bonds, okay? Or what we call weak attractive forces. Now on the other hand, if we have low vapor pressure, low vapor pressure means very little vapor. And it is much more difficult for it to evaporate, okay? It's very difficult for it to evaporate. That's why it creates very little vapor. So if it is difficult for it to evaporate, that means it has strong bonds or strong attractive forces. Okay, so you need to understand the difference between high vapor pressure and low vapor pressure and how it relates to the strength of the bonds. So this now leads to boiling point. Boiling point. So here's your definition for boiling point. The temperature at which the Vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the external pressure. So your external pressure would be your atmospheric pressure. And boiling point decreases as pressure decreases. So that is saying that the po boiling point, so BP for boiling point, the boiling point is going down 
due to the pressure going down. Okay, they are related. See how both of the arrows are going in the same direction? So if they're going in the same direction, then this is a direct relationship. All right, a direct relationship. So pressure goes down, therefore boiling point goes down. Now if your pressure went up, then your boiling point would go up. So now let's relate all this boiling point stuff to temperature and altitude and some of the other things that we've talked about. So let's think about this. If you are up in the mountains in a high altitude area, the pressure is higher or lower in a high altitude area. So in a high altitude area, the pressure is lower. So let's kind of draw this out. So high altitude, which means the pressure is lower. Okay, the pressure is lower in a higher altitude area. So, how is this going to affect your boiling point? How is this going to affect your boiling point? And then also, how is this related to cooking time? how long it takes to cook food. So you probably have heard the very common question, you know, will an egg cook faster um, in Denver where it's a very high altitude or will it cook faster at sea level where we're at, we're at sea level. All right, so altitude goes up, pressure goes down. All right, altitude goes up, pressure goes down. Therefore, your boiling point is going to be lower. All right, the boiling point will be lower. But then, how does this relate to cooking time in a high altitude area? Well, if the boiling point is lower, that just means your water's boiling at a lower temperature. So instead of the water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, it's boiling like, let's say, around 90 or something, 90-ish um, degrees Celsius. So how does that affect your cooking time? Just because it's boiling faster because it's reaching a lower temperature, um, does that mean your food's going to cook faster, necessarily? Well, the answer to that would be no. Your food is not going to cook faster in a high altitude area. The temperature can only get to about 90 something degrees, whereas at sea level it gets to 100 degrees. All right. So remember, cooking time is based on the temperature of your water. All right. It's based on the temperature of your water. So it will actually take longer to cook an egg at a higher altitude than at sea level. That's why, like, if any of you have ever watched those cooking shows, like Iron Chef or whatever the case is, um, and they have to cook all this food in a short amount of time, many of the times those chefs would use a pressure cooker to help speed up the cooking process, the cooking time, right? They would stick whatever it is they're trying to boil and cook in a pressure cooker so it can cook at a higher temperature and then therefore cut down the cooking time. Now let's talk about solids and solids and liquids and this whole process here. So this arrow should really be moved over here. We have a double headed arrow between those two. All right, so solid to liquid, obviously we call that melting and then going in the reverse liquid to solid, we call that process freezing. So notice that we also have a double-headed arrow, which means we have equilibrium, but in order to have equilibrium, once again, it has to be in a closed container, and yes, those rates would be equal, okay? The forward rate equals the reverse rate. So the rate of melting will equal the rate of freezing. Let's talk about the difference between ionic compounds and molecular compounds, and how their melting points will vary. So here we have two different substances, NaCl and H2O. So their melting points are listed underneath them. This right here is not a zero. That's the little degree sign. It should be written correctly on your notes. So the melting point for sodium chloride is 801 degrees. And then for water, it's zero degrees. So obviously, sodium chloride has a higher melting point. Okay, so one of these compounds is ionic and one of them is molecular. So sodium chloride, is that ionic or is that molecular? Well, that is ionic, right? A metal and a non-metal, 
So ionic bonds are much stronger than molecular bonds or covalent bonds, so molecular. Water's molecular, okay? So ionic bonds are much stronger than molecular compounds, therefore they require more energy, right, more energy to break those bonds. And then this is just a little side question here. What is the freezing point of water? Well, if the melting point of water is at zero degrees Celsius, well, the freezing point of water is also at that same temperature. Okay, here I have um, pictures of, these are examples of what we call allotropes. Allotropes. You don't really need to know allotropes for the test, but I just kind of want to explain to you what allotropes are. So diamond, graphite, and the buckyball over here. The buckyball is the one right here that looks like a soccer ball. All three of these compounds are made out of carbon atoms. All of them are made out of carbon atoms only. And so notice, although they are made up of all carbon atoms, their structures are very different, okay? And this is what we call um, an allotrope. So an allotrope contains all the same atoms, but they have different structures. So since they have different structures, therefore they have different chemical and physical properties. All right, so the very last type of concept that we need to talk about for this chapter has to deal with phase diagrams. So phase diagrams basically plot temperature and pressure. So look at how the X and the Y are labeled. We have temperature here, and then on the Y axis, we have pressure. And so if you were to plot temperature and pressure, then you can plot the points on this graph, and if it falls in this region, then it's a solid. If it falls in this region, then it's a liquid. If it falls down here, then it's a gas, okay? So this is the phase diagram for water. All substances would have a different phase diagram, but this is just your example for water. At this point right here, where all three lines intersect, that is what we call the triple point, okay? The triple point. So that's what the T3 is labeled here in the P3. So at that particular temperature and that particular pressure, when they plot those points, you will see all three states of matter coexist, okay? But it has to be at that temperature and pressure. All three states of matter will be in what we call equilibrium. And then there's a few things that you have to be able to identify from your phase diagram. So there's a dot right here that intersects the solid liquid line. So that point right there that intersects the solid liquid line, so notice that it's related to this temperature. And then look at the pressure, one atm, okay? This is in atmospheres. So if you extend out the atmosphere line, standard pressure, it intersects there, and then it'll intersect the liquid gas line over here. When it intersects the solid liquid line right there, we call that the normal melting point, okay? The normal, so that's melting point, because that, it, or it could be called the freezing point, because um, that is what occurs between solid and liquid, melting or freezing. So you can call that the melting point or the freezing point. But notice I wrote the word normal, okay? It's called the normal melting point or the normal freezing point. The word normal refers to um, standard pressure, Okay, at standard pressure. Okay, so then if we move across, and when it intersects the liquid gas line right there, that is referred to as the normal boiling point because that is what occurs between um, liquid and gas, right? Boiling, boiling point. And so that's what the TB right there is um, referring to, is the boiling point for water. Now, here's a different phase diagram. This phase diagram is for carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is CO2. So this phase diagram, you can tell, is very different. It also has a triple point. It has a solid, liquid, and gas phase. Now, I want to point out the standard pressure, or what happens at standard pressure. So here's standard pressure, 1 atm, right, because this one is labeled in atmosphere. Look what happens as we move across, as we move across or extend out our standard pressure, it goes from the solid phase 
directly into the gas phase, right? So at standard pressure, we are at standard pressure once again, sea level, it's going from the solid phase directly to the gas phase, okay? It is completely skipping the liquid phase. This is what we call sublimation, as it goes directly from solid to gas, all right? That is called sublimation. That is also why they call CO2, they call it dry ice, okay? They call it dry ice because it doesn't get wet. Well, at sea level, it doesn't get wet, okay? Completely vaporizes. It goes directly from the solid phase into the gas phase. That is everything for chapter 10. So it is very conceptual. And then some of the math stuff that you need to know is um, how to convert your different pressure units. But that is it. And I will see you guys later. Bye.